Hi guys, hope you can hear me okay. Essentially, this is the first of six PowerPoints I've made during lockdown that are like a quick revision summary of the OCR A-level law course. Our exams are getting chalked off and I didn't really want this work to go to waste, so I hope this helps. Anyway, let's get straight into it. Uh, firstly, the Courts of England are miles. Now, generally speaking, although it's unlikely you'll ever get directly questioned on this in an exam, it's good to have a basic understanding of both the criminal and civil structures, like what they're used for, their purpose. So starting with the criminal court structure, the lowest court in the hierarchy is the magistrates, aka the court of first instance. This is where summary offences are heard. Next up you've got the crown court, that deal with either way cases. Then you've got the court of appeal, the first of the appeal courts, they deal with challenges to decisions in the Crown. Then you've got the highest court in the land, the Supreme Court. They hear appeals on arguable points of law and general public importance. They generally concentrate on cases of the greatest public and constitutional importance. Sorry. Then you've got the Divisional Court that deal with judicial reviews made by other courts and tribunals. And they hear challenges to decisions made by certain people and government bodies where legislation has given right to challenge. Next you've got the civil court structure. You've got the county court and magistrates that deal, deal with generally minor civil disputes. Then further up the hierarchy you've got high court that is split into three sections. So the QBD deal with contracts sorry, wrongs against a person, for example, e.g. like defamation. Uh, then you've got the family court that deal with like divorce, custody cases. Then you've got the chancery that deal with business disputes and property. They generally involve a lot of money. Then you've got the court of appeal that here it challenges to decisions made by lower courts and hierarchy. And then you've got the Supreme Court that also deal with challenges to previous decision decisions, but they're generally involving more money and more high profile cases. In the civil courts, people find out the process their case will follow based on the track it has been allocated to by a judge. Small track is for cases of up to ten thousand and one thousand pounds personal entry limit. Fast track is for 10,000 to 25,000 and multi track is 25,000 plus. For the appeals process for civil claims, you've got the district judge, which is in a county court where appeals go to the circuit judge county court. You've got the circuit judge county court where appeals go to the high court judge county court. And then you've got the circuit judge county court which appeals go to the Court of Appeal Civil Division. Now that there's a leapfrog there because that you're hopping one court in the hierarchy and this only occurs when there's over 50k in a high court. Another topic on Section 8 is Alternative Dispute Resolution. Now there are many different types of ADR, one of them being arbitration. This is when a neutral third party makes a decision that parties agree to follow. Parties remain in control as they choose a date, time, place and arbitrator. Witnesses can be called, it's legally binding and enforced. Uh, a decision equals a ward in this and you can choose a single arbitrator in the panel. Now positives of this is procedures can be written, papers or hearing, and the award is final, binding and can be enforced. Uh, negatives for arbitration is if a legal point pops up, no one is really qualified and prof professionals can be expensive, especially in commercial arbitration. Another type of ADR is tribunals. This is the civil court system. Cannot go to normal court as don't really have the expertise on certain topics. There's many types and only deal with their subject matter. There's three on a panel, judges, a qualified lawyer and the other two are wingmen with experience in the matter. 
uh, lawyers are generally discouraged. Uh, legal aid is not available usually, and the hearings are informal. So the positives of this is that it relieves pressure on the courts and two non-lawyers who are experts on the panel. Uh, the negatives are that it's more formal than other types of ADR and there's no legal aid available. Another type of ADR is negotiation. This is where two people slash groups reach an agreement without help or anyone else. Uh, these decisions are not legally binding though. Uh, another type is mediation. This is where two reach an agreement with third party help. They don't offer any suggestions or advice. The third is really a guy between or like a peacekeeper slash like referee. It's not legally binding. They're often a trained professional, doesn't have to be though. Um, then you've got conciliation. This is the same as mediation really, but they actually do offer suggestions and advice and they can be involved in discussions, but any decisions like they, they don't make in the end. It's not legally binding. Uh, the positives for all of these are that the parties remain in control can withdraw at any time. They're cheap as no court and there's less time. Uh, spent in the courts and another is parties can continue to work together after. Uh, negatives of these ADRs is that the amounts won are lower than if you'd gone to court and one party may be weaker and so could be bullied into a settlement. Now the only alternative to ADR is litigation actually going to court. And the positives of this is that courts have a choice of remedies so they can find the right one for the case. Another positive is that the decision is binding and actually enforceable. Uh, there is an appeal process but not many have to use it and there's generally fair procedures. The negatives is that litigation takes a long time. It can be expensive, especially for hiring lawyers. Um, there seems to be a lack of e legal aid and unwanted, unwanted publicity. Moving on to sentencing, the aims slash theories include retribution, deterrence, including both individual and general, rehabilitation, protection of the public, and reparation. Aggravating and mitigating factors include use of a weapon, guilty plea, repeat offender, vulnerable victim, first offence, gun attack, uh, range slash type include probation order, conditional discharge, unpaid work and prison sentence. Looking more closely at the range and types of sentencing, firstly you've got custodial which is a prison sentence that must be so serious to be justified under CGA 2003. Uh, the Sentencing Council set guidelines on appropriate lengths, 21 plus a sentence to custody, uh, 21 minus to detention at a young offenders institute. Sentences can be immediate for life, for example murder, or for a set period of months slash years, for example six months for an assault, or can be suspended even. You've also got a community order, which again must be so serious enough to be justified. This is a mix and match sentence with a number of suitable components, for example unpaid work, treatment, curfew. The aim of this is to combine punishment with rehabilitation tailored to suit the and the seriousness of the crime. That's a mouthful. Um, D may also be ordered to pay a fine, max 5k and max, going towards gov or compensation. Alternatively, uh, they may be given an absolute or conditional discharge in some cases. As long as they don't re-offend in that time, there's no further punishment. Moving on to the next topic, magistrates. For selection, you must be 18 to 65 upon appointment. Live slash work near the local justice area. If you're selected, you must enter training. Although still you're not technically legally qualified really. Um, applicants to the local advisory committee have to then interview. 
test one of that interview is to test for the six key qualities, which includes commitment, reliability, good, char good character, there's quite a few more. Uh, test two is a test for judicial aptitude, so that includes like how good you are at decision making. The LAC attempt to get a good cross section of society. If successful, the LAC pass recommendation to the Lord Chief Justice. This is in relation to the Crime and Courts Act 2003. A candidate is then sworn in at a local court ceremony. You can be disqualified from selection if you come under any of the following serious convictions, members of the forces, police, disability or hearing problems, bankrupts. Now, some positives of this is that magistrates are cheaper, they're more socially aware, and they have less prejudiced verdicts because they're more mixed and diverse. However, um, there could be some bias. There's not, they're not really qualified legally, and this could mean there's inconsistencies in sentencing. The legal rules for magistrates and their role in criminal cases come under the Justices of the Peace Act 1997 and more recently the Courts Act 2003. Magistrates are required to six 26 and a half unpaid days a year. They sit as part of a bench consisting of a chairperson and two less experienced wingmen. Uh, the legal advisor provides legal advice and reads charges but can't influence decision. The mags are left to concentrate on evidence and consider appropriate sentencing. The mags court hold early hearings for not guilty cases. If I have a way case, they will decide on the court for trial and deal with the bail applications. If D pleads not guilty, indictable cases go to Crown Court. If guilty on the other, on the other hand, uh, mags can sentence on the spot or send to Crown if they feel their sentencing powers aren't sufficient. Or if they, or if the case is indictable, summary and IFOA procedures are the same. Also, they issue warrants for a search and arrest and enforce financial penalties. Um, their role is to verdict findings of fact. Uh, their max sentencing powers they can do is six months and five k max fines. Mags with added training can sit in a youth court for trials. Legal rules for juries are contained in the Juries Act 1974, which was recently amended by the CGA 2003. The Jury Central Summoning Bureau is responsible for selecting juries in England and Wales. Qualifying for selection, you must be 18 to 75. Your name must be on the Electoral Voting Register. You must live near a court and in the UK for at least five years since 13 years old. You may be disqualified for jury service if you're mentally ill. Um, you may be disqualified permanently if you've been to prison for five plus years and temporary for minus five years in the last 10 years. And you can also be temporarily disqualified for uh, being given community order in the last in the past 10 years and anyone currently on bail. Uh, you may be disqualified if because of excusal as of right. So members of the public services, for example the army, are granted if commanding officer sends letter saying they're needed elsewhere. Also the elderly and the seriously ill are disqualified. Um, you can also have a discretionary deferral, so jury duty can be delayed, granted they have a good reason. For example, vetting, challenge to an array, or challenge to calls. The role of juries. Twelve jurors are used when D pleads not guilty. The judge decides points of law, the jury decides facts. They are sworn in and listen to evidence. They make notes and ask questions to the judge through the usher. Jury deliberations are in secret. They select a foreperson who manages discussions and announces verdicts. When they decide a verdict, 
when they decide a verdict, it's either un ununanimous or a majority. If they can't decide, it's a hung jury and the case has to be tried before another jury. If anyone discusses what happens in the jury room outside of court, they risk punishment under Contempt of Court Act 1981, which was seen in the case of R.V. Frau. In the exam, you might be asked to evaluate the use of lay people. So here are some points. Um, you've got cost for magistrates, which is an advantage, and for juries is a disadvantage. You've got bias against slash towards police. So magistrates disadvantage, juries disadvantage. Uh, inconsistency between different geographical areas. There's a slight disadvantage in magistrate, but they more or less follow the guidelines. And for juries, it's a disadvantage. It's so weight of numbers, magistrates, it's a disadvantage. Juries, advantage. Diversity, disadvantage, because only 10% ethnic makeup of magistrates. Uh, juries is a positive because they're randomly selective. Um, lack of competence in the law, disadvantage for magistrates because they're not legally qualified. And juries, disadvantage because it's argued they're not necessary as a focus on facts. For the judiciary, qualifications include Supreme Court for 15 years, barrister or solicitor, or appeal. Appeal Court, 7 years, barrister, solicitor, or high. High Court, 7 years, barrister, solicitor, with 10 year advocacy certificate. Circuit, 7 years, barrister, or solicitor, or district, or tribunal chair for 3 years. Recorders, 7 years, Bar or solicitor, district five years barrister slash solicitor or fellow of uh, Silex, so a legal executive. Uh, for appointment, judicial appointments commission set up by the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 recommend to the Lord Chancellor people, and the appointment is eventually made by the Queen. For selection, applicate you must have an application form. Three to six references that there will be an online test interview which includes role plan discussions they look for qualities like intellect integrity independence sound judgment decisiveness fairness authority and communication skills efficiency you don't have to remember all of those just a few will do um, their role is to make decisions in respect of disputes in a fair unbiased way, uh, applying the law and the legal rules of England and Wales. Now, th these rules are contained in the Courts and Legal Services Act 1990 and the Tribunal Courts and Enforcement Act 2007. Uh, you should only have to remember one of those. Moving on to independence of the judiciary. For independence of the judiciary, it is important that judges have security of tenor, although there are exceptions for dismissals when required. The Lord Chancellor um, is the one to fire inferior judges, and the monarch is the one to fire superiors. Although, for the monarch, this is never really used as power. They usually retired off through ill health. And this usually happens after a petition from both Houses of Parliament for superiors of incapacity and or misbehaviour for inferiors. Along with this, judges are immune from suit, are independent of the government, are impartial in all cases. Judicial independence is needed to protect the liberty of the individual and for judges to be able to act without fear and pressure, for example, from, being, from fear of being dismissed on a political whim. The advantages to this is that it ensures fairness in all cases, it protects citizens against the unlawful acts of government, and it ensures public confidence. The idea of independence of the judiciary comes from the doctrine of separation of powers. Now, this was pr proposed by Montesquieu in 1748. 
this is to have the legislative, the legislative, the ex executive, and the judiciary separate. Now the rules for superior judges and inferior judges come under the Constitutional Reform Act 2005 and the Courts Act 1971. Lastly, I've got some general information about legal professionals. This comes under the Courts and Legal Services Act 1990. You might want to dot some of these down if you don't already know, but you probably should by now. Um, this brings us to the end. Thank you for listening. Uh, if you've got any questions, please comment and I'll try and get back to you.